Hello. Can you hear me? Is it working? Is it on? Is it on? Should I put yeah, it higher? We'll put a little bit up. Mm -hmm. Here, what about yeah. this? Yeah. All right. Uh, so what are we going to do today? Today we are going to continue the discussion of uh, the discussion of fluctuations, quantum fluctuations during inflation. Uh, so we started the discussion yesterday and we derived the, the two-point function, uh, two-point correlation functions for the scalar fluctuations and tensor fluctuations, which we call zeta and gamma. Um, so now we want to talk more about it and talk about the, uh, uh, the observational constraints on these predictions of inflation. Uh, but I wanted to, so let me start from something that I didn't emphasize very much yesterday, which is that uh, I, uh, I discussed this particular choice of gauge uh, in which the, we chose uh, time, time slices, constant time slices to be surfaces of constant inflaton. And then we define uh, some scalar perturbation called zeta in this particular gauge. So let me uh, talk a little bit about uh, why, uh, why this is a good choice or why this zeta variable which is defined in this way is going to be the quantity that is conserved. Of course, uh, we, we can just verify this by brute force. We saw that if we choose this particular gauge and plug it in the action, then we find uh, an effective action for zeta and gamma variable, which all, always have derivatives of these variables. And therefore, they, outside the horizon, they do not evolve. They don't have any mass them or potential. But it's good to, it's, it's good to have some intuitive idea of why, why this is the case, or why, how we came up with the idea of choosing this particular gauge. Um, so, we want to ask uh, why is uh, zeta dot equals zero? And by zeta dot, I mean zeta dot outside of the horizon. So maybe I put a subscript L here, which means that it, we are considering a super horizon fluctuation. Uh, so let's, uh, let's again draw this picture. We, saw, we said that we are going to choose the slices, which, are, which corresponds to constant phi. So we choose this as, a, as, a, as our time slice. Uh, let's see, what do I want to call them? Let's, let me call um, this phi star and this phi f. Say so we want to go, and, uh, and phi star is the time at which some particular k mode that we are interested in is going to cross the horizon. Uh, so this corresponds to some k eta star equals to 1. Uh, all right, so uh, we want to imagine that we have some, uh, and let us also remember how the metric looked like in this case. So in this case, by definition, we have phi, uh, phi of t and x is just a uniform uh, function of time given by the background field. And then the metric looks like, uh, this. So we use this ADM parametrization, H I J D X I plus N I D T uh, times D X J plus N J D T. And this H I J was uh, A squared e to the two zeta times uh, delta ij, the Kronecker delta, plus gamma ij, the tensor fluctuations. 
Uh, all right, so uh, we can for the moment forget our tensor fluctuations. We want to discuss why zeta is constant. Now, what does this zeta do for us? Uh, this is essentially the only variable that uh, encodes the, the scalar fluctuations. And essentially what it does is that it tells us about the shape of these hypersurfaces. So if I wanted to calculate the intrinsic curvature of these hypersurfaces, the the, there is an induced metric on these hypersurfaces, which is this Hij. So imagine I was some... Uh, there were some little creatures which, who lived on these hypersurfaces and wanted to measure the shape of this surface or measure its curvature. They would uh, calculate the curvature for this metric. Uh, and this data variable is directly related to the curvature of that, uh, meaning that uh, Laplacian of zeta up to a factor of two and minus sign uh, is the curvature of this surface. So the shape is essentially encoded in this variable zeta. And of course, if you want to be more precise, also gamma ij. Uh, now, now, why is it a good choice? Let's imagine we have observers, two observers, one and two. They live far away. Uh, where, so we have this surface which is bending, it has some fluctuations on it. And we have two observers. And these observers, what they do is that they measure, uh, they do local physics. Like imagine we, for instance, we have uh, telescopes that measure Hubble parameter. They do the same thing. They, they measure physics in the local universe. Uh, so what do they see? The idea is that uh, if you remember, we said that we, the, this, uh, the slow roll solution that we are considering is an attractor solution. Uh, the property of the attractor solution was that once I determine phi, I also know phi dot. So if I consider uh, if I want to consider the evolution of the universe that this, uh, this observer sees. So this observer measures the value of phi, which is phi star. And since we are considering a solution which is attractor, once we know phi star, we also know phi dot. And everything, uh, essentially, that fixes all, uh, since we are just doing a single feed inflation, this fully fixes our uh, cosmology, or the local cosmology that this guy is going to measure. Uh, this one is also measuring phi equals phi star. And therefore, again, because we are an attractor, it's, he will measure the same local cosmology. So if these uh, two observers have some history books and they record what they measure, like the local, for instance, the Hubble parameter that they measure. Imagine, for instance, they have the Hubble telescope, and they measure the, the Hubble parameter. They will see identical histories. In particular, they see identical H of t. Can I turn on that? Thank you. Um, they see identical H of t. Identical history, in particular, identical h of t. Now, what, is, uh, what do we do with h of t? If I want to calculate how much the, the universe expands over some time, if I measure Hubble, I just integrate the Hubble over time, and this gives you the amount of expansion of the universe. So log of a, so let's talk about a1 and a2. So these are the scale factors of these local cosmologies that these people, local universes that these two observers are measuring. So log of A1 of Tf divided by A1 of T star is equal to log of A2 of Tf divided by A2 of T star. And if both of them are equal to integral of H of T from T star to Tf. 
dt. Now, the fact that these ratios are equal, that's equivalent to saying that zeta of t final is equal to zeta of t star. Because if these expansion rates were different at these two points, then the shape of this surface would change. For instance, it would become like this. And since zeta is encoding the, uh, the shape, the information about the shape of the surface, then with this time evolution, we had to change the value of zeta. So this is the, this is the reason why this choice of variable is uh, a clever choice for talking about the scalar fluctuations. Okay, so now with this choice, what did we, what did we get? We get, we got, uh, uh, we got, we found the statistics of this data variable. So we said that if we have, um, if we have inflation, then if we sit at the end of the inflation, say, let's call it eta reheating. I look at the look at the fluctuations of this data. Those have a, those have the following two point function. Zeta of k, zeta minus k prime is equal to uh, so this is something that we call it power spectrum. Uh, I think Raul already introduced it. And here we said that this is equal to h squared over uh, 4 epsilon and Planck squared kq. So we have these fluctuations of zeta here. Now let me uh, also say a few words about why uh, why we care so much about these zeta fluctuations. If you are, as you have probably heard many times, we say that inflation is giving us the initial condition for the perturbations in later cosmology. So imagine we have reheating at this time. Uh, so here there is inflation, which produces some uh, fluctuations of zeta with this variance. And then we are supposedly reheating to a radiation-dominated unit. Now, in this radiation-dominated universe, we, what do we have? We have a radiation fluid, and we want to study perturbations of this radiation fluid. So for instance, this radiation fluid has some T mu nu, which is rho plus P u, mu, u nu uh, plus P g mu nu. And we want to see how the pert So this, of course, this rho and P are uh, to a good approximation, they are uniform, but there are some fluctuations on those. And we want to study the evolution of those fluctuations. So we want to do linearized perturbation. So we want, for instance, we are interested in delta rho over rho and v, the velocity. Uh, it's also convenient to work whenever we, we want to study fluctuations inside the horizon. There is a there are more convenient choices for the gauge, like for instance, Newtonian gauge. As, it, uh, uh, as you can guess from the name, it's Newtonian gauge because it makes it easy to make connection with Newtonian gravity. So when gravity is weak, that's a good choice of the uh, gauge. For instance, you will have, you will explicitly have, have the Newtonian potential and that Newtonian potential, if we are in radiation dominated, it, it decays. If we are in matter domination, it's constant linear level. So there, is a be there are better choices than this gauge choice when we are here. So we, we make or the most choose some convenient gauge choice. And then we want to solve the. Einstein equations for this system. 
say, at the linearized level. Now, this is a, this is a standard problem. You, uh, you can find the system equations that you get in many textbooks. Uh, but so why do I tell you this? I, I want to emphasize the following fact. That at the end of the day, the, when we do this calculation, we are, one thing that we obtain here is that there is, in this uh, radiation fluid plus gravity system, there are, there are scalar fluctuations. This corresponds to the sound waves in this radiation fluid. And, uh, and of course, since we are doing linearized perturbation theory on FRW, the, we can talk about momentum modes or uh, Fourier modes. And as we saw in the previous lectures or two lectures before, since in radiation dominated universe we are we have W, so here W is a third. We are above the threshold W equals minus third. So we know that what happens here is that modes, uh, momentum modes enter the horizon and then start oscillating. So what we get here is, uh, is some wave equations for these variables. So say, for instance, delta. And we talk about delta of k, we get a wave equation for this variable. Uh, and we need, uh, we need some initial condition to find the actual solution of this wave equation. Uh, and the initial condition is set by inflation. So uh, what we do is that we take the, this system of equations and then we match it to what we obtain by calculating uh, what we obtain in inflation for the superhorizon fluctuations of zeta. So there is a very simple way of converting from this gauge, or actually this gauge, at superhorizon this gauge to the, for instance, Newtonian gauge. So that tells us what is phi, for instance, at time at eta equals zero as a function of zeta. So there will be a connection between phi at eta equals zero and the zeta variable that we show it is constant. So we match these two, and once we do that, we have the initial condition for this system to evolve it forward. So for instance, let me give you an example. So in, in this radiation fluid, if I actually solve this problem for this delta of k, I, I will find the following solution. I will find delta of k uh, is it starts from a value which is minus four thirds zeta of k, and then. goes to some higher value, and then it keeps oscillating with amplitude for zeta of k. And this point, when it's the, the, so this is zeta of k as a function of eta, the conformal time. Um, and the wavelengths, so these are all, asymptotically, this is something like minus four zeta of k cosine uh, Cs k eta, where in this radiation fluid Cs squared is just one thing. And so as you see, the, the, the wavelength of this oscillation is 1 over Cs k. So this is something of order 1 over Cs k. So that's why we care so much about uh, this power spectrum, because it gives us the solution that the solution for these wave equations in the subsequent phases of the universe. Now, this is a very interesting plot. This is essentially a cartoon version of the CMB uh, 
bar, uh, acoustic oscillations that we see. Uh, and there is a very crucial fact that we can see this acoustic oscillation, and that's the uh, and the reason for that is that all of the K modes that we consider, they all start with this, they all have the same phase. So in principle, if we were solving this wave equation, uh, at late times we would have this cosine solution. And we could imagine that maybe there is some mechanism that produces fluctuations in this radiation fluid. And those fluctuations propagate with this, they have this cosine form. However, unless all of these different modes have the same phase, which is zero, then on CMB, we wouldn't see these oscillations. Those phases would be washed out, and we would just see some average. So the, the fact that we saw these peaks in CMB, that was a, a very strong indication that the fluctuations that we see are coming from superhorizon. The initial condition is set at superhorizon. That's probably another uh, uh, another uh, uh, evidence for for inflationary models, which is not at the level of the level of its prediction for the fluctuations. Um, all right, is there any question so far? No question. Sorry, what, what is the argument of the different phases that you mentioned that are important? Oh, I'm saying that if the uh, if if we imagine that there is another mechanism, so if the, if there is not inflation, I think people considered actually this possibility. Before, before seeing the peaks in the CMB, they consider the possibility that maybe there is some phase transition, or I don't know, cosmic streams, and those are producing these fluctuations that lead to, I don't know, become the seeds of perturbations that we see in our universe. Uh, so even if, even if such a mechanism could work, it's uh, unimaginable that it produces fluctuations in exactly the right phase, all of them with the same phase, so that we see the acoustic peaks. If, they had, if these fluctuations were produced with random phases, then the acoustic peaks would be washed out. But if the fluctuations are primordial, then uh, the, uh, the, that uh, primordial ori origin uh, automatically sets all of the phases to be fixed. Basically, this is the, the fact that here the derivative of this function is zero, is, uh, uh, is forced by the fact that we want them to be, super, uh, to be primordial, to, be, to come from super horizons. Uh -huh. Then can you have different phases for these two fluids? Um, or they are all the same? Uh, if I have two fluids... Um, well, we, can, we can discuss later. I, would, I, I imagine that at the level of matching to the initial condition, still everything, as long as we talk about adiabatic fluctuations, which means that we have just one one uh, right one scalar degree of freedom. I think uh, yeah nothing happens. But then it's true that when you have neutrinos, they they can affect the phases of BAO, and that's yeah that's I think that's I would call it an evolution effect rather than rather than something about the initial condition. Other questions? Uh, 
Um, all right, so another, so I mentioned why, so how this zeta parameter is connected to what we observe. It's directly related to the, the perturbations that we see both in CMB and in uh, the structure formation. The, the gamma variable is also, also has some observable imprints, uh, which I just mentioned. I don't say too much about it. This gamma IJ will uh, affect the polarization of CMB, CMB photons. So it can in, uh, introduce a, uh, a polarization pattern of CMB, which is called a B-mode polarization. And that is, very, uh, that is very distinct. It's something that cannot be produced by the scalar fluctuation. Uh, so this is something that we are actively looking for uh, and would be a very exciting uh, its detection would be very exciting for inflationary models. It will have very interesting consequences. Also, the, also the upper bounds or constraints have very important implications. Uh, but yeah, I'm not going to say much more about it. Maybe someone talks about it in these lectures. Yeah. Uh, OK, so now I want to. So now we, I, I think we agree that these zeta and gamma variables and the, their power spectra are of quantities that are uh, related to what we observe. Uh, so I want to extract a few more uh, or define a few other variables or quantities that are more directly connected to what uh, experimentalists talk about or give, they give plots in terms of. So uh, what is the first thing to talk about? Let's talk about the tensor to a scalar ratio. Or well, before that, I should, of course, say that the first thing to see is the amplitude of this fluctuation. So we measure, for instance, the amplitude of uh, CMB temperature fluctuations. So that's the first thing. Uh, and then uh, after that, we can ask about the amplitude of tensor fluctuation. So it's common to normalize the amplitude of tensor fluctuations by the amplitude of the scalar fluctuations, fluctuation, because we, are, we have already measured the scalar fluctuations. So that is something that is called R. We affected it because it, uh, it's, it turns it into a, an order one or, I don't know, order percent uh, quantity. So the, the definition of tensor to a scale ratio is to add up the power for the two polarizations. So remember, gamma had two polarizations. So we add up the power of two polarizations and divide it by P zeta of k. And uh, this is going to be sixteen epsilon. So in the way, in the slow roll regime, this is something less than one. Can I ask a question? Yeah. You actually don't measure P of zero, right? You measure P of delta, right? It, it, yeah. And there's there can be factors like four, like you put it there. Uh huh. Uh huh. So the so the sixteen epsilon takes into account the four, or. Yeah. So the sixteen epsilon, well, R is defined in that way. So if we measure, for instance, P of delta or P of delta T over T, we know uh, we just use linear perturbation theory and we translate it into some P of zeta. And that, that, but that is, I think, the definition. So we always convert it to P of zeta and then do this uh, comparison. Uh, 
Um, yes. So for instance, here I. So here, for instance, we saw what how we do the com, com, comparison or conversion. We we might be measuring delta rho over rho the fluctuations in temperature or in the energy density of our fluid, but that delta rho over rho has a simple connection. Or the amplitude of that delta rho over rho has a simple connection to primordial fluctuation zeta. Here, for instance, inside the horizon, the relation is just minus four. So once we measure it in terms of delta, we translate it to zeta and then do the comparison. Uh, so yes, so the, we get this idea. This is less than one. Uh, how much less than one? For instance, we can consider the, uh, our favored model of inflation, m squared phi squared. And if you remember, in m squared phi squared, in order to get the 60 e folds of inflation, we, uh, we, we needed, well, first of all, in m squared phi squared, we, we derived a relation for epsilon. Epsilon was derived to be twice m Planck squared over phi squared. And uh, we saw that if we want to get uh, 60 e folds of inflation, then phi should be over the 60 and plan 16 and Planck. Uh, which means that which means that R in, so I can just plug this in here, uh, it gives me R for m squared phi squared inflation to be something over the one over A. Not over the uh, approximately one over 0 0.12. Can be, you know, 1, 000, nothing forbids it to be uh -huh. a million. Right, right, right. Change our oh, uh, yes, yeah, so actually here I, uh, I was a little bit sloppy. Uh, this comparison should, of course, be done at the scale that we are measuring, measuring uh, quantities. So uh, I, I should have put some K star here. And K star corresponds to the momentum at which we are doing this, uh, doing these measurements. Uh, and therefore, if we do that, then now if we look at the expression for the power spectrum, both for zeta and gamma, uh, there is K dependence in it. Well, in fact, that is that. Uh, naturally leads to the discussion of the tilt, uh, which I wanted to talk about. So we have p zeta of k and p gamma of k. And if you remember, p gamma of k was twice h squared divided by m Planck squared times k cube over k cube. Uh, now, these expressions were derived Assuming that h and epsilon are constant. Of course, h and epsilon are not constant during inflation. They are slowly varying. Uh, so how should we interpret those results? The way to think about them is that, remember, we derived this. Uh, we derived the action for zeta. It looks like, so we had and the usual measure, d3x, a cube, uh, twice m Planck squared. Let's see, was it twice? Maybe not twice. Um, uh, no, just m Planck squared. Times epsilon uh, times uh, 
zeta delta square minus 1 over a squared grad zeta square. And then we had a similar term for the, for the tensor modes. And Planck is squared over 8, gamma ij dot is squared minus 1 over a squared, um, d, um, let me just write it like that, grad gamma squared. So what we did to derive those expressions for the two-point function was that we used uh, or results for the uh, two-point function of a free field on the sitter. We showed that for a free field on the sitter, we get those two-point functions. But now, these fields are free fields uh, on a near the sitter background with some uh, non-standard normalization factors. So we took into account the normalization factors to derive uh, those expressions. Uh, however, uh, so this, this is a result for exact sitter. We are not in exact sitter. There is some time dependence of the Hubble parameters and also epsilon. Uh, however, one, one thing that we can see from here is that since this uh, variables, the, the action for this variables uh, does not have any non-derivative terms. What happens is that outside the horizon, they remain conserved. It's also related to what we discussed earlier. Uh, so we can just use our derivation using the, using the sitter, a field in the sitter, except that we use the variables in these expressions to be evaluated at the time of the horizon cross, meaning that I should put a star on H and on Epsilon here and on H here. And a star means that we are evaluating H and Epsilon and here H, we are evaluating those at, at a particular time, which corresponds to K eta star over the one. Okay, so once, so what does it imply? It implies that there is a, of course, there is, a, there is an explicit K dependence in these formulas for the power spectrum. But there is also an implicit K dependence because we are evaluating these uh, parameters, these quantities, H and Epsilon, we are evaluating at a particular time that is K dependent. So that's the implicit K dependence. And uh, that is important because, so for instance, when I talk about this ratio or when we talk about the amplitude of fluctuations, we, we are talking about observing a particular set of momentum modes. And those are the ones that exit the horizon around the 60 E foldings before the end of the inflation. So that's how this NE equals 60 enter the discussion, because we are talking about the momentum modes that exit the horizon around that time. And therefore, we want to evaluate variables like H and Epsilon. We want to evaluate them at NE or near NE of order 60. So that's why I plug phi equals 16 and Planck here. Uh, if inflation was going on for 100 or 1,000 EFOs before that, uh, those fluctuations that were produced at that time would have, have different amplitudes and different ratios, but those are not the ones that we are observing. So this is the one that we are observing, or hopefully, or we are putting constraints on. And so, so what's the upshot? M squared phi squared is ruled out today uh, because we have an upper bound. We have an upper bound on R, which is uh, about. So this is from uh, from 
constraints from BMOS or non-observation of BMOS, which tell us that uh, two sigma, the R has to be less than 0.08. Uh, so, yeah. Now, similarly, we can apply this, uh, we can ask the same, this question, obviously, for different models of inflation, like different potential. Uh, and then you see, now I'm going to talk more about them. Uh, you will see that there, these constraints have, have consequences on what, which models can be viable for our universe. Exp uh, describing our unions and which models are not anymore. Uh, okay, so before uh, before doing that, let me since we already discussed the, the scale dependence of this quantity, let me also talk about the tilt. So I write here uh, delta r less than 0 0.08. So this is r of m squared phi squared, which is larger than delta r. So let me erase this and also introduce the tilt, which is exactly what I uh, was mentioning. So tilt, uh, let's first do a scalar. Uh, is there any questions so far? Uh, yeah, so we, what we saw was that this power spectrum has the explicit K dependence and also has implicit K dependence. Uh, so tilt is uh, basically the question of what is the K dependence of this power spectrum. Uh, it is uh, conventionally defined, so tilt is NS, NS minus 1 is defined as derivative with respect to log k of log of k cube p zeta of k. So this is the tilt for, for a scalar fluctuation. Now, let me just tell you why, why there is this weird ns minus 1 here. The reason is that uh, originally the, the scalar tilt was defined for the variable uh, delta rho over rho, the density, matter density fluctuations. And then if you'll probably see uh, that the, there is a transfer function that relates the fluctuation in zeta to, uh, to matter fluctuations. So originally it was defined for P of uh, delta and then at, at very large scales, that P of delta is related to K to the fourth time P of, times P of zeta. So this minus one, if you bring it here, it becomes K to the fourth times P of zeta. It will be really just tilt of that P of matter flushes. But anyway, for, uh, for us, it's just a definition. We want to, this NS minus one, what does it do? It tells me that how much uh, how much this P of zeta is uh, deviating from being exactly a scale invariant. Um, so this derivative is d by d log k of log of, so this k cube cancels the explicit k dependence a log of derivative of the, uh, the log of that expression, I can drop the constant parts because they are inside the logarithm. So what I have here is h star squared divided by epsilon of h star. And again, the k dependence come from the fact that I'm evaluating them at a the particular time. So this d by d log k is just minus d by d log eta, eta star. And that, the, that derivative can be related to a time derivative. So minus 
d by dr log eta is 1 over h d by dt. And this is equal to, uh, now if we go back to the definition of the slow roll parameter, remember we defined the slow roll parameter, uh, which uh, were the measures of how good is this is slow roll approximation. Uh, so one of them was related to h dot over h, h squared minus h dot over h squared that we call it epsilon. So if we do this, we get minus 6 epsilon uh, plus uh, 4 eta. So let me just remind you, epsilon was 1 half v prime over v uh, and Planck v prime over v squared, and eta was uh, v double prime over 3h square. And again, we saw that if we take some, for a given potential, we can calculate this tilt. Sorry, we can calculate this epsilon and eta parameter, and therefore we can calculate the tilt. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes, everything is evaluated at the same time. Um, and then similarly, we can uh, de define the tensor here. Now this one, the, here the conventions is more natural. So this, this is just NT is defined as D log K of log of K cube P gamma. Okay. By the way, not everyone is following this convention. For instance, I think if you are looking at Malasena's paper, he just takes, doesn't write an NS minus one, so his definition of NS is this. Um, but I think this is the most the standard convention. Uh, okay, so of course you can do this, ask the same question for P gamma, and yes. Uh, don't I need to assume a slow roll condition? Yes. Sorry, I, you're confused about what? Yes, yeah, we assume that. Uh huh. Uh, given that you have shown that it's related to epsilon and eta in this uh, star position. So wouldn't then uh, ray be much more under one and then an S, an S would be close to one? Oh, uh huh, uh huh, yes. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, uh, we are. We are working in the slow roll approximation, so this epsilon and eta are small parameters. Epsilon and eta are both less than one, which means that this whole quantity is much less than one. And yes, it's true, and s is close to one. Uh, but that doesn't mean much. It is close to one. Well, it does mean something. It means that we are close to being exactly a scaling variant. 
the scale invariant here means ns equals, exactly scale invariant means ns equals 1. Right, yeah. And it has been measured not to be one, right? Yes. That, that's the interesting part. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I draw some plots in a moment. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so we can do the same exercise here, and we get, uh, so here is easier. The only, this, the only scale dependent quantity is going to be h squared, h star squared, and that gives us minus 2 epsilon star. Uh, note, by the way, that this uh, nt is equal to, so let's compare it with this exp expression. Now, here there should also be a star. Uh, this nt is. Uh, minus 1 over 8 times r. And this relation between nt, let me write it again here. This relation between nt and r is sometimes called tensor consistency condition. So it's just relating to, if we happen to measure tensor modes, uh, and we also uh, observe the tilt of the tensor power spectrum, then uh, they, are, they have a very model-independent relation. That's why it's called consistency condition, uh, because it doesn't depend on details of the inflationary model that we are going to write. It's a very robust prediction of mod uh, models inflation. Although I should say that, uh, as I already mentioned yesterday, inflation is a very, is a paradigm. There are many different models of inflation. Uh, almost any prediction of inflation can be changed in some some model of inflation. But there are more uh, more standard models or more minimal models of inflation, uh, which have a set of more robust predictions. And then you can go away from those models and start changing one prediction or the other. Uh, as a result, it's hard to rule out inflation. In general, it's hard to rule out a paradigm. Uh, what happens is that uh, if you keep, uh, well, we, we don't keep, but if you start seeing many things that do not agree with the predictions of the simplest models, if you need to keep uh, making it more and more contrived, then you would probably start looking for alternatives, and maybe one day you find a better alternative. But however, at the moment, it seems that it's the, it's the best, uh, best theory that we have to study the initial condition. Uh, if, and relatively simple models of inflation are in very good agreement with, with observations that I'm going to now give some, uh, some toy picture of them. So they usually people draw these uh, plots of R versus NS. So we have measured NS to be uh, to be to deviate from one. So these plots, there are these uh, counter plots. So it looks something like this. If this is one. So I already said there is an upper bound at the two sigma level of R, 0.8. And then NS uh, is measured to be something between 0.96 and 0.97. So I think the contour plus looks something like this. So now if you have. Uh, whatever your take, you can take your favorite inflationary model, and that would put a dot in this plot. 
For instance, we saw that the ms squared phi squared is already out it's somewhere here. There are many other models that are inside this region. This is a one sigma and two sigma count. Uh, you can even think about slightly modifying this m squared phi squared model, for instance, by adding an extra, an extra field. That, for instance, can bring it inside. So there are, there are, this, there are many models. Uh, but, uh, so this, but this plot shows that how, how uh, our observations are very powerful in constraining the models that we have. The models give us prediction. We can compare it with what we observe. Oh, sorry, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, I think I said everything that I wanted to say about the power spectrum. Are there questions? Yeah. Curves here. The lower one is m squared phi squared. Oh, these curves? No, no. These curves are, these curves are one sigma and two sigma uh, constraints. Um, squared, so any model of inflation that you consider that gives you a point in this diagram. So m squared phi squared has a particular prediction for r and particular prediction for NS, and now it happens to be outside the two sigma contour. That's why I said that M squared phi squared is ruled out. In fact, it's far even, even worse. Yeah. Uh, Oh, yes, yeah. It depends on the efficiency of reheating, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. What about alpha attractors? Alpha attractors? Well, I should say that I'm not, I don't, I'm not an expert. Uh, but alpha attractors, I think they are, it's not a, it's not a single model, it's a family of models. And this family of models can, uh, I think they have, they have they can have very large range of values in this plot. So no, I don't think they are. It's, I don't think that family of models is ruled out. It's, in fact, I'm almost sure that they are not ruled out. Yes. Sorry, repeat. You said there are a lot of models inside the allowed region. Yes. Uh, are there simple models? What are the models that are simplest? Like I guess the simplest is the Starobinsky model, which trans translates into, again, a particular shape of the potential. Or maybe that is something good to mention. Uh, so what is the? So let's see. From here, you see that if I put an upper bound on R, if I say R has to be a small, it means that epsilon has to be a small. Uh, on the other hand, we have measured ns minus 1 to be, so this ns minus 1 from the measurement is something of order minus 0 0.03. Right? So now, if I make epsilon to be a small, then eta has to compensate for it, right? So that's, what this, that's why these two measurements are complementary and nice. Uh, R, upper, upper bounds on R make epsilon a small, then you have to compensate for eta, and you need eta to be negative to, uh, to get the right NS. Eta is the second derivative, is the curvature of your potential. So it means that you need a concave potential. So the models that are 
now in business are the ones that are concave. Uh, these are, so usually, when, remember we're talking about the power law potentials, so those are the com convex potentials. So those are essentially all now out. But the, the concave mo models are working, and those, the, the property of those models is that you need to introduce a new scale. So that is why uh, inflation models now are a little bit less simple than what, what they could be, because now when you consider concave potential, you want to end it at some point. So you have to say that it has to, uh, it has to come, I don't know, you have to reheat, so you have to put the new scale in the potential. But uh, that's, for instance, uh, so there are, there are these, these small field models that, that give predictions in here, like a Starobinsky model. So these are potentials that do have a scale in them that tells you uh, that you, they have a plateau, but then at some point, because there is an explicit scale, the, the plateau ends and you reheat. No other questions. Um. Okay, so then I, I start talking about young Oceanity. which is another, another predictions of inflationary models that we are hoping to, to observe. So far we have, we have constraints, very strong constraints, but uh, no, no detection. Uh, okay, so what about non-Gaussianity? Uh, let us, uh, okay, I keep drawing these diagrams. Let me do it again here. So what we did so far was that I, we said that we have this inflationary phase. And this is, again, eta and x, time, time and space. And we said that there are these, uh, what we do in, in inflation is that we derive for instance, correlation functions or two-point two power spectrum of the fluctuations of zeta evaluated at some time. So this zeta was a field. Uh, you were interested in the superhorizon profile of this field. We some zeta of x and eta r the reheating time. We went to the Fourier, to the momentum space, and then we calculated the, the two-point correlation function, the, essentially the variance of this. Uh, now, let us, uh, yeah, maybe we, uh, it's useful to think a little bit more deeply what we did. Uh, so what we were, here we were talking about the quantum fluctuations of this field that lives in the curved space-time, in a near the seated space-time. Uh, so of course, when we talk about quantum fluctuations, the, uh, the, those quantum fluctuations can be or are described by a wave function. So there is a wave function of uh, this zeta variable, so this is, our, uh, this is our quantum field, and there will be a wave function. There will also be gamma, but for the moment, let's focus on zeta, given that we already saw that r is a small. So there is a wave function that describes this uh, 
probability for configurations, different configurations of those data. So if I want to cal calculate probabilities, we follow the usual rule, we, we square this psi, so we get some distribution functions that give me the probability. And now, how do we use the distribution function to calculate the cor correlation function? We just integrate it. So for instance, let us go back to the harmonic oscillator. So there, this rho is given by, uh, what is this, uh, omega over pi e to the minus 1 over 2 omega squared x squared. So if you are in the ground state of a harmonic oscillator, we, we have a wave function which is Gaussian, and then we square that wave function, we get again another Gaussian distribution, a rho of x. And then when uh, it's a very natural to, to a natural question to ask what is the variance, uh, what is the expectation value of x squared, or various operators, uh, when we are in this particular state, when we are in the ground state, and we calculate those uh, by integrating over all configurations here over all x weighted by this distribution function. So what we did uh, yesterday was essentially calculating the, this, uh, this two-point function for a quantum variable without ever talking about the wave function. But of course, the wave function exists. We actually, we have essentially calculated that wave function. Uh, because, uh, and that's, that's related to the discussion of the Gaussianity or non-Gaussianity. So uh, look at this uh, distribution function for the harmonic oscillator. So this is a Gaussian distribution, which means that all of the correlation functions are determined by uh, uh, are determined by the by the two point correlation function. So the moment I know the two point correlation function, I know the full distribution. Uh, by the way, this was I was going to write this one of the two omega. Uh, so if, for instance, if I ask about x correlation functions of x n, uh, this is equal to 0 if, if n is odd. And then it is equal to uh, something like n factorial 2 to the n over 2 times n over 2 factorial times x squared 2 power n over 2, when n is even. So for this Gaussian distribution, everything is fully determined in terms of the two-point correlation function. Now, uh, if we, uh, let's see, do we have the action? No, I erased. Uh, so if, if we now go back to the problem that we did yesterday, Uh, so first we consider just the free field uh, in the in a this in the sitter space. So for that free field, as uh, what kind what action did we obtain? For the free field, we obtained the following action: s was integral of the eta. Oh, by the way, also. When we had this free field, we went to the momentum space. And we saw that in the momentum space, different momentum modes decouple from each other. So essentially, a free field uh, translates into a, a set of uh, free oscillators. So let's go to the momentum space, d eta, d3 k. And now if, it, if we remember the action is 
going to be 1 over 2 h squared eta squared times uh, phi k prime squared minus k squared phi k squared. So for any k mode, I essentially have, an, have, have a harmonic oscillator. So if you want to do the mapping, phi k prime goes to x dot squared, and k, k squared goes to omega squared, and phi k goes to x. So every one of these phi k's is like a harmonic oscillator. Uh, the only difference with this problem is that uh, this harmonic oscillator has a time-dependent mass. So that's why the answer that we got is different from the answer for the harmonic oscillator. It made the qualitative difference. This time-dependent mass made the qualitative difference in the distribution function when k eta is less than 1. So this is this, is this time-dependent mass, right? If we want to do this mapping, uh, to the harmonic oscillator, then mass would be 1 over h squared eta squared. So it's a mass that at late times it goes to, goes to infinity, exponentially fast. But in any case, uh, the, the, the wave function that we are going to get for this system is again going to be a Gaussian wave function, meaning that uh, once we know the two-point function, we actually know the full uh, distribution function rho, the modulus squared of psi. So I can just write it down here. Rho of phi of k uh, is up to some field independent uh, normalization factor is uh, given by so there is some field in independent normalization factor times exponential of minus integral d3k uh, one over twice p of k. This p is the power spectrum, is the which we define there. P is just the normalization, the two-point function when I take out the delta function. And then here we get phi k, phi minus k. So effectively what we did yesterday was to calculate the, the Gaussian distribution of a free field in the theta. And then we said that if we consider this action for uh, zeta and gamma, they, and we go to momentum and space, there will be a quadratic piece of this action which looks very similar. And then we calculate uh, the widths of those. So the same story is true for uh, zeta and gamma. At that quadratic order, this is the distribution function that we are getting. Uh, however, this Gaussianity is, of course, just an approximation uh, because we are not dealing with the free theory. Gravitational theory is intrinsically interactive. It's not free. And we can see in a very simple example, for instance, uh, if we consider If we consider our harmonic oscillator, but add some non-quadratic term to its Lagrangian, then we can easily see that the ground state wave function of this interacting theory is not Gaussian anymore. In particular, the higher point correlation functions are not uniquely determined in terms of the two-point correlation function. There would be, if we, just, if we are just going to measure the correlation functions, we will find new information in the higher point correlation function. 
So say we consider L equals one half x dot is squared minus one half omega is squared x is squared minus, say we add a lambda x to the fourth term in here. Uh, then uh, a very useful exercise is to calculate the, the expectation value of x to the fourth in this model. And see that this is, uh, there is a, an additional contribution to this expectation value of x to the fourth, which is not the ones that I get from the, from just two, two point function. So that difference is usually called the connected four point function. So I will get a disconnected contribution. But this, this contribution that you get from a, a Gaussian distribution, these are called disconnected contribution. Why? Because what I basically did here was that I had x uh, and x's, and what I did was I just paired them with each other in all possible ways. So it factorizes into a product of a bunch of disconnected uh, terms, a, a bunch of two-point functions. But here, when I calculate uh, the correlation function for x to the 4, there will be an additional term. Uh, now, as a matter of principles, they, so now the, the problem that we are dealing with here in the case of fluctuations during inflation is very similar conceptually. Uh, we, we derive an action for zeta and gamma. So there are parallels. We derive an action for zeta and gamma. So there was some second order action. It looks kind of similar to the second order part here as we saw there. Uh, but there will be, there will naturally be higher order contribution, S3 S and s fourth and so on. Why? Because just the gravitational theory is uh, nonlinear, intrinsic. So once you have these nonlinearities, uh, as long as they are not very large in some appropriate sense, uh, we can calculate the contribution of those to the correlation functions in a perturbative fashion. So here, for instance, how, how would I do that? Here, the, we, we have a machinery to do that. If we want to calculate uh, this uh, expectation value of x to the fourth, uh, we, uh, we, have the, we, we have the machinery of perturbation theory. So what do we do? We say that we want to calculate this. When I write this, I really mean calculating this expectation value in the vacuum of the interacting theory. So it's usually called by omega. Now, vacuum of interacting theory might seem something uh, hard to find. We knew how to find the vacuum of the free theory. I remember here we had a long discussion of to, how to choose the vacuum when we, have, we are dealing with this free theory. We had the positive frequency and negative frequency modes, and the vacuum was the one that is annihilated by the operator that multiplies the positive frequency mode. So we know how to choose the vacuum of the free theory. How do we find the vacuum of the interacting theory? Uh, for that, we have tricks, right? The trick is that we define this uh, evolution operator, say, for instance, from some time, some time t to time 0. And then what we do is that we, we, we apply that uh, time evolution operator. to the free theory, but evolve it for an infinitely long time along a contour that is slightly tilted in the, 
uh, in the Euclidean time, in Euclidean plane. And what this does for us is that it projects the vacuum of the free theory into the vacuum of the interacting theory. But at the le in practice, it's uh, not at this level. It might sound a little bit uh, uh, maybe intimidating. But in practice, it boils down to very simple algorithms to calculate perturbatively the correlation functions. What we do is that we go to the interaction picture, we write uh, fields in the interaction picture as a as one over square root of two omega a e to the minus i omega t plus complex conjugate, and then we have some simple algorithm to calculate this expectation value. That simple algorithm is to uh, take evaluate everything using the uh, using the creation and annihilation operators in the free theory. So we put here uh, an evolu anti-evolution operator in the interaction picture from zero to minus infinity. Let me just put this epsilon here to indicate that I have rotated the contour. And then here we put xi to the fourth. And here we evolve it. Well, here we evolve it forward. Two times zero, insert or operator evolve back for two times zero, and these UIs are given have some expressions. T1, T2 is equal to time order product of e to the minus integral from T1 to T2 dt h interaction. And so everything in here is, uh, can be performed uh, in a perturbative fashion. So as long as this lambda is a small, I can order by order in lambda calculate that x to the fourth expectation value. And a similar and almost identical thing can be done in the case of inflation. If I find uh, this uh, action which has cubic term and quadratic term, I can apply the same machinery to calculate this nonlinearity. Now, here uh, I'm not going to do an explicit calculation because although it is uh, it is a straightforward, it uh, takes a lot of time. Uh, in fact, probably I should stop now. <laughs> Uh, how much time do I have? Zero? Zero. Okay. Uh, yeah, then I, uh, let me see. Is it there? Yeah, so I'm not going to do an explicit calculation here. Maybe I give some little exercise. Uh, but uh, I will talk about uh, some particular forms of non Gaussianity uh, tomorrow. Uh, and maybe do some estimates of, define the FNL parameter and do some estimates of what, what we should expect in, if we include interactions. Um, yeah, that maybe something to, something that, or I can do, even say that too much. Okay, I stop here. Question? Okay, thank you.